All right, I'll get started. Um, so, my name's Jeff Snyder. I work at a hedge fund called PDT Partners based in New York and London. Um, and I'm also part of the Evolution Working Group on the C++ Standards Committee. And I'm here today to talk about data in the type system and how complex non-type template parameters in C++20 help this. Okay, so the idea for this talk came from um, last year's CPPCon when I went to a few talks in one day, all of which um, relied on this particular language, non-standard language feature. Um, one of them was by Hannah here, um, who did the same talk, um, or a newer version of the talk this morning. It was a fantastic talk, you should go to it. Um, use your time machine to go back to nine o'clock. If you don't have one, there is a publicly accessible one run by Google, it's called YouTube. Um, so Hannah was trying to do compile time regular expressions. And she wanted to write this thing where you wrote CTRE, colon, colon, match, and then you put your string, your regular expression, in a template parameter, and then you could match on it and it would compile it and into really efficient code. Um, but this isn't valid C++, so what, um, what she ended up with was this, um, this user-defined literal with the uh, code in. And this isn't standard C++ either, but this can at least be compiled. Um, Richard, uh, Richard Powell also was trying to do um, this implementation of, of uh, named arguments. And he, uh, halfway through the talk, he, um, he found that he had this compiler warning telling him that um, after he'd used these, this, this is what he wanted to write. He wanted to write this, uh, these arguments with named, um, you know, name of argument underscore arg. And it was important that this had a different, um, a different type for each argument. Um, and he got this compiler warning saying, string literal, op string literal operator template through a GNU extension. Um, so what both of these talks, these talks were trying to use was what I call the forbidden UDL. Um, and this is a form of UDL that's implemented by Clang and uh, GCC, but it's not in the standard. Um, and I want to understand why I want to look at the other forms of UDL and see how this one is, is a bit different. So for string UDLs, we have um, we have a one form of string UDL. It takes a const char star. Actually, there's loads of ones that take wide chars as well. There's really only one form. It takes a const char star and a size, and it it's just a function. It takes two parameters. It returns whatever you want it to return. Um, and you use it as per line five. Just say string underscore my UDL. We've also got numeric UDLs. These come in a couple of forms. One is, one is cooked forms, where you write one, two, three, underscore my UDL, and you get the number 123 past your function. Um, we've also got this const char star form. It's called a cook, uh, sorry, this is called a raw form. So instead of getting the number 123, you still write a number, but you get the string one, two, three out. Um, so far, all of these are just, they, they're called operators, but they're just, they're just functions. They take parameters of fixed types. They return a fixed type. Um, the last form of num numeric literals is, is a bit different. It, um, it takes every individual character, one, two, and three, as a separate character as a template argument. And this means it's no longer just a function with a fixed return type. It is a function template. You can change the return type depending on what those characters are. But we only have this for, for, uh, for numeric literals, um, which means you can only, the input data to it can only be things that match the PP number grammar, which basically means it can't be anything that doesn't look like a number. Um, and so the forbidden UDL is the equivalent of this, but for, but for strings. It's where you would take a, um, you would write a string before the underscore arg and you get all the characters of that string passed as individual template arguments to your, your operator. So this was alluded to in the original proposal, back in 2008, the original user defined literals proposal. Um, and they, they highlighted this, um, some complexities around how you would define it. And went on to say that since we are not aware of compelling use cases, we avoid the issue by not bothering with any form of raw string UDL. Um, so that was the, the state until about 2013, when Richard Smith wrote a paper called Literal Operator Templates for Strings. And this proposed adding the forbidden UDL 
as I've put, had it on a previous slide, um, to C++. I think it was uh, C++ 14 that was proposed, proposed for. Um, and the committee rejected this, despite um, Richard saying there were there, there appeared to be use cases now. Um, the compilers didn't support it at this point, but there appeared to be things we would want to do with it. So let this rest for three years, and Louis Dion came back with a paper called Reconsidering Literal Operative Templates for Strings, um, which pointed out that now not only did we have compelling use cases, we had two implementations of it. But still, the, the committee was concerned about um, the expense of implementing this, the overhead of treating strings in this way, uh, and called for proposals to come back for better ways of dealing with strings at compile time. So let's have a look at whether these concerns were, um, oh, I've gone two slides ahead there, um, whether these concerns are justified. So this is, um, I'm going to be looking at the, the peak compiler memory usage when we compile a few code snippets that involve some fairly big strings. Um, so I haven't printed out the whole string here, but just trust me, it was a megabyte long of random data. Um, and this is, this is about how big I needed to make the strings to get a linear relationship between length of the string and memory usage, and not have it be covered by noise. Um, so if I just use a normal, use find literal, um, taking a const char star, then we see that um, GCC uses somewhere about four bytes of memory per character in the string, and Clang uses about two and a half. So what happens if we switch that out for the forbidden UDL? Well, <laughs> it uses a bit more memory, just a little bit. Uh, GCC uses 50 bytes for every character in your string, and Clang uses about 278 bytes for every character in your string. So this isn't that surprising. A, a template parameter and template argument, they're fairly substantial objects in, inside a compiler. You would expect them to be, have a fairly heavy representation. Um, but people want to do this anyway, so let's take a deeper look at why. I'm going to be talking about template parameters versus function parameters. So I'd like to propose a model that if I put my data in parameters, in function parameters to a const text for a function, then via writing different code in my const text for a function, I can generate arbitrary data out. I get to pick one return type, it's a fixed return type, but I can put whatever data I want in that return type, and it ends up as a single blob of data in my executable. If I template on, if I, if I pass my data as template parameters on the other hand, I can generate arbitrary code. I have, I can change the return type, I can do almost anything at that point. So why is this? This is um, a trivial example of a const text for a function, and we're going to read it bottom to top. Um, we start off with a const text for argument. It's a const text for int. It's clearly a constant expression. We pass it to foo. We get it as an integer parameter. So this is, this is all compile time. And we try to static assert on it. And the compiler says, static assert expression is not an integral constant expression. And this is something that, despite this being around for a long time, I still find is occasionally misunderstood. And that even though your function is const expr and you pass a const expr value in, inside the body of the function, the parameter is not a constant expression. You cannot static assert on it. You cannot template anything on it. But you can still pass it to another const expr function and get the value back. And you can then return it. And when you do, the const expr result, when you pop out of the, the top level const expr function evaluation, the thing you returned becomes a constant expression again. But we're in the middle, you don't, get, you don't get to do anything fancy. It's just like normal code. So if we look at the equivalent code with template parameters, we pass constant argument in. But this time, we put it as a template, template argument. A template argument is a constant expression, always. So we can static assert on it. We can pass it to another, another function. We get a constant, a constant expression back. And then we can do fancy things with it, like use an if const expr on, on these, these constant expressions we have. And unlike a normal if, with an if const expr, I can return a different type from each branch. Because the, the branch that isn't taken is effectively like, it's like a template that isn't instantiated. 
So here we have our first example of something where we have put data into this function, and the type we get out depends on the data. And normally, data depends on code, not the other way around. But here we have, we're starting to see code depending on data. So let's have a look at a deeper example of this. And this is the simplest example I could think of that was, that was meaningful. Um, what we're going to do is write a type safe printf wrapper. This has been done at previous CPP cons, but I'm going to do this with a sort of um, value heavy uh, flavor to it. It's using less types and more, more context for values. So the general idea here is we're going to template this, this uh, print on, on a string, hello world, uh, percent zero three D. Um, and print is then going to be a lambda where the parameters to the lambda depend on the content of this string. With this particular string, the parameters are going to be just one int because I have 1% 03D there. That's, um, that's called a conversion specifier in the, in the standard ease of, of printf. So we have one conversion specifier in here. D maps to int, so we should get a lambda with type int out, with a parameter type int out of it. Uh, this isn't going to be feature complete. There's a lot of things about printf I'm not going to, I'm not going to implement due to time and slide space. So how are we going to do this? So make print is going to be the um, is going to be the thing that generates our lambda, and it's going to be a fairly simple recursive implementation um, that takes a format in. And you see, I've got this const auto ref format thing here. I'll get to exactly what that is in a moment. Um, it's going to take in um, this string, and we're going to look for a conversion specification in it um, with this function called find conversion specification or find conv spec. Um, if we found one, we're going to recurse. And we're going to accumulate the results of that. If we eventually, we're going to not find one, and then we're going to want to take all the conversion specifications we found, extract the types of those conversion specifications and form a lambda that just takes arguments of those types and passes them on to printf. Now, you could also like, do some, an actual implementation of this without using C printf, but this is easier. So the first thing we're going to need is fixed string. This is a simple class that, I can, um, that just takes the, the data of a string and um, holds it as a member rather than a standard string will have a pointer to the heap, but I can't make a const text for object of type that because I of type stood string because I can't have a pointer, I can't have a heap allocation in a const text for object. So I can have a const text for object of type fixed string because it has all the data inside it. Um, okay, I'm also going to define two classes for conversion specifications. One is just a dummy type to represent no conversion specification. And I've written this uh, operator bool so I can just test it for truth and test whether it's a real conversion specification or the dummy not a conversion specification. Um, and then I'm going to, the conversion specification class, the real one, is going to be templated on the type that that conversion specification should accept. So int in our previous, in, the, in, a, in our example. Um, the other thing that's going to be in this slide, in this um, class is the end position of the conversion specification in the string so we can track where we need to look for, start looking for the next one. Okay, so this is find conv spec. This is the uh, most code dense slide I have, um, but it's still, it's fairly simple. Um, we're going to template on the format again and the position to start searching. Uh, this format, this fixed string, I didn't show on the slide, but it has all the standard std string functions that you can eat, you can, that aren't prohibited by uh, the implementation strategy. So you can just run format.find, find a percent, uh, and if we, found, if we didn't find one, we return that no conf spec class we defined just now. If we did find one, then we start looking for the character that ends the conversion specification, so the D in percent %03D. And you'd probably want, in a real implementation, want to actually parse the stuff in the middle, but I'm taking shortcuts here. Um, if you didn't find one, we static assert that this was an invalid format string. Right? You've got to, if you start with a percent, you've got to have a, you've got to finish it. Okay, if we if it was valid, then we start searching various strings like CDI 
um, so C, D, and I are all the conversion specification characters that correspond to int. Similarly, S is the only one that corresponds to string. X, uh, big X, U, and O, these can correspond to unsigned, etc. There's a few more of them. But we just go through these, finding which one the conversion specification we found corresponds to, and return a conversion specification templated on the type. We also pass in the, uh, the position at the end of it so we can then carry on. Okay, so back to make print, how we build the lambda. Um, so this has now got the full, um, the full signature of, of make print. We've still got the format, which is going to be a reference to a fixed string. I would love to have a fixed string as an actual template argument here, but C17 doesn't allow me to do that. So what it doesn't allow me to do is have a reference. And it allows me to have a reference to something if that something is a, is a global object with linkage or it's a class static. It's got to be, it's got to be something with linkage. Uh, we're going to have a position, which is going to just track how far we are through the string. And then we're going to have a pack of these references to these conversion specifications. So we're going to call conspec, find conspec. If we found one, we recurse. We template again on format as is. We um, pass in the position to start, start searching next. And then we, part, then we try to accumulate the um, conversion specification. So we've got all the, ones, all the ones we've already accumulated. And then we have to do this, this kind of funny thing. We have to take the conversion spec and turn it into, from a local variable, a local context for a variable, into a global object with linkage. So I've got this little helper called object underscore v. And to make an object with the right type and value, I have to template object v on comspec, or the, the, the type of the conversion specification I had, and then I need to give it the value of the, the only member within it. So I've kind of got to tear this object apart to put it through template parameters, to have it put back together as a global, and then I can pass it on to, um, to the next iteration of make print as a reference, which is kind of nasty, but it means you can sort of do a class in it as a non-type template parameter in C++17. Uh, similarly, I would like to just be able to say decal type com spec and pick out the, um, pick out the value type here, but uh, it's a reference type, so I've got to decay it, and then it works. So lastly, to call it, I have this, um, I have to do that, this thing once more where I pull this, where I make a global object. Um, so in this case, I've got all these characters of uh, hello world, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I pass it to, I pass those characters to this thing called fixed string V, uh, which makes an object of type fixed string of the right size and passes all the characters into it. And then, then I'll have a global object of type fixed string, which I template make print, make print on. And then that's basically it for, for a C17 NTTP flavored um, implementation of a printf wrapper. But we had to jump through a few hoops to make this work. And you might reasonably question why it was necessary to jump through all these hoops. So, ah, some transitions. All right, there are limitations to um, C17 uh, non-type template parameters. You can have integral types, you can have enumer en enumerators, so enumerations, you can have pointer types, you can have L-value reference types, uh, but you can't have floating point and you can't have classes. So why not? Why don't we just say that classes can now be non-type template parameters? Like, what would go wrong if we did that? So, what we'd want this to look like is we have struct point, and instead of having a uh, templated function f, which takes x and y as separate, separate template parameters, I just, have, um, I just have one template parameter of type point, and then I don't have to reconstruct the value within my template. It's just more like straightforward, straightforward function parameters just in the template uh, angle brackets instead of in the parens. Um, and I expect you have some intuitions about how this would work. But let's take a deeper look into how this would work. And let's take us on to the topic of equality and identity. So by equality, I mean 
are the two parameters, so the two arguments I passed into, uh, I passed as parameters to two um, instant instantiations of a template, are they equal? And then is the, um, say I'm instantiating a struct, is it the same struct type I get back? So you would expect, looking at these two, that um, so I've got, I've got the, my, my point type, I've templated struct x on it. You'd expect that if I template x on point zero zero and point zero zero, that is the same type. And for zero zero and zero one, you'd expect they're not. But let's have a look at what happens to other types. So now we've got a struct templated on a simple integer. Um, Anyone want to hazard a guess as to which of these are the same, which are different? So, I mean, it's fairly obvious. Zero is equal to zero, and x of zero and x of zero are the same type. Um, similarly, zero is not equal to one, and, and x of zero and x of one are not the same type. Okay? Uh, what about enumerations? There's a little bit more of a subtlety here. Um, the, straight, the straightforward thing happens for one and two, but what if I ask you, like, what happens if I template on one and also one? Now, in the enumeration, these are defined to have the same value. So they compare equal, but they're different enumerators. Well, the standard says that even though they're different enumerators, they have the same value, they compare equal, and you get the same template out if you, if you template on one and also one. Okay? Uh, what about pointers? So here we have struct x templated on any pointer. Um, and first we take a, um, we declare i putter to be the address of i, and we say, is x templated on i putter the same as x templated on the address of i? And then we do the same, but with null putter instead of, instead of um, a real, you know, a non-null putter. And here it says, okay, i putter is equal to the address of i, and x templated on the two of them is the same type. But for if if but with the non putter, non putter is equal to null putter, and x templated on null non putter is not the same as x templated on null putter. But this is just because I'm being a bit tricky here, and I have templates on auto put, auto star instead of int star, and there is there is a hidden hidden parameter when you use auto, which is the type of the thing you're templated on. So x templated on non putter is different from x templated on null putter because one has type int star and the other type has type null putter t. If you um, change this to int star, then they're the same. Okay, so we kind of have this rule that if your non-type template parameters have the same, uh, compare equal and are of the same type, then the template you get, you get, they have the same template identity. You have the same template instantiation back if you use them. So let's have a look at what happens if we try to apply this to classes. So once again, we've got our point here, and now we're templating struct x on point p. Uh, and we try to say, is, is x of point 0, 0 the same as x of point 0, 1? And the compiler says, I can't compare point of 0, 0 and point of 0, 1 because there is no comparison operator. So what would that mean for template instantiation? Well, let's say we just throw, throw a uh, default comparison operator in there. Since C++20, we have the ability to have these defaulted comparison for, um, operators. They just compare member-wise, uh, which is kind of what we want. So now the compiler is going to say, if you're using uh, GCC9, which has got um, prototype support for uh, classes as non-type template parameters, it's going to say that point zero is equal to point zero, and so x templated on the two is the same type. Similarly, if they're different points, you get different types. Okay. So, what if instead of defaulting that comparison operator, I make it return false? Now we're in an odd situation where point of zero zero is not equal to point of zero zero. So, what should happen? When I write a template on these, do I get different templates every time I, every time I write x templated on point zero zero? Do I get different different types? Well, 
this brings us to the first requirement for non-type template parameters um, for, for class types which are to be used as non-type template parameters, and that is they must have strong structural equality. And this basically means that they have a defaulted uh, comparison operator, so it's going to compare member-wise. And not only that, all members must also have defaulted comparison operators, same for bases, um, and there are a few other restrictions, like you can't have references in there because the default comparison operator compares through references rather than comparing the address of them. And you can't have floating points in there because floating point behaves funny and like minus zero is different from positive zero, but they compare equal and nan doesn't compare equal to nan. And so you don't have strong, stru strong structural equality if your object has a floating point value anywhere in it. Okay. There's a slightly deeper reason why you need to have this, um, this equivalence between member comparison and, and comparing the object, um, or at least an equivalence between member comparison and the identity of the template you get, um, which is that when you template, on, on template a function on something, um, the compiler is going to admit a name for the instantiation of that function um, it's going to emit what we call a mangled name after putting through this, this mangling process. So in this example, I'm, I'm templating foo on 10 and 20. Um, and you can sort of squint and see that inside, the, um, inside that mangled name, you see the name of the function foo, and you see the number 10, the number 20. So if we have a look at what happens with the prototype GCC9 implementation if we template on a point instead, you basically get the same thing. It's just like you, you just have the name, the type point in there now as well. It becomes that's the type of the template parameter, so you need it needs to be in there somewhere. But otherwise, the members, the, the values of the members within point have become part of this mangled name. So that's um, let's, have, let's have a look at uh, what happens when you actually use one of these. Um, not like template parameters of class type, because uh, we have um, when we have non-type template parameters in C plus plus seventeen. Um, take this this int i int i when when I use it within the body of foo is what's called a pr value a pure r value, and this means that it's not really an object; it's just a way of initializing an object. So. I can call this print function, it's just taking an object by const ref, with i, but i isn't an object. The compiler is going to synthesize a temporary object in order to call print. And when you call print, okay, everything works, you, works, you get out the value zero, as you expect. But if you try to print out the address of i, then the compiler is going to tell you to go away because it's a r value and you cannot take the, it's, it's a pure r value and you cannot take the address of a pure r value. Okay, so what if we throw a, non t uh, a class non-type template parameter in here? Um, in this example, I'm templating on a value of type s, and I'm calling a function called print this, which is going to print its own address. So if s is an R value, capital S is an R value, then we're going to need to um, synthesize a temporary of type s in order to call print this. Okay, so suppose we did that. This works, we print out some point of a temporary out of this function, but it does something, it compiles. That, that was like the first, the first idea of how to make this work. But what happens if we, if we um, do something like this? We're gonna, we're gonna take an, the beginning and end of an array. Now in this case, we've called a.begin and a.end, and in both of those expressions, we'd be taking a pure R value, making a temporary, and then making an iterator to the begin or the end of that. But the begin and the end would be begin and the end of different temporaries. So what happens when you try to um, actually iterate over this is undefined behavior. Um, I think if you actually try this, Clang uh, gives you an infinite loop and GCC somehow works anyway. I don't know what it's doing, but it somehow works. So, so what we did uh, is we decided that class type class non-type template parameters have to be L values. And that means instead of just being this, this sort of ephemeral way of initializing an object that exists at compile time, 
the compiler is actually going to emit into your binary an object which has the value of the non the argument you used to uh, you used as your for your non template parameter. So this makes use cases like this just work because now when you call a.gin and a.end, they're just the same object. All right. So what classes can we use as non-type template parameters? Basically, the, the requirements are they need to be literal types, as in you need to be able to construct them at const extra time, and they need to have uh, trivial destructors. Um, they need to have strong structural equality, and they need to not have any mutable or volatile su sub-objects, because uh, if you think about what would happen if you had a, a, a fixed object in your binary representing a constant expression, and you try to then modify a mutable member of it, I, I don't know what that would even mean. So, uh, so they're just disallowed outright. OK, now we're going to look at the most useful class that satisfies these requirements, which is fixed string. And we looked at this earlier. Uh, but the, the version I've got here has one small difference, and that is that we've defined a uh, friend auto operator equals equals, a, a standard defaulted uh, comparison operator, which means it has strong structural equality now. Um, OK, so let's see how we can use this. Well, we can have a function foo templated on fixed string of length 13, and we can pass the string hello world into it. And I'm sure some of you are counting the characters in there to make sure I got that right. Uh, <laughs> But I don't want to be counting characters when I'm programming, so this is, uh, I definitely don't want to write a different function foo for every, for every different length of string I pass in. So we can do slightly better. We can template on the length of the string and a fixed string of that length. OK, now I only have to write foo once, but um, at least I still have to count my characters at the call site, um, which is quite dissatisfying. But there's a feature called class template argument deduction we introduced into C17 that kind of saves us here. And class template argument deduction gives the, let, lets us specify a way of deducing that template argument, that length of the string. Now, sometimes you just write your constructors and it works. Um, in, this, in this particular class, it doesn't work because a string literal of 13 characters is an array of 14 bytes because there's an null character. So you want to accept an array of n plus 1 characters to get a fixed string of length n. And that plus 1 stops the implicit argument deduction working. So we write this deduction guide you see on lines 8 and 9. And then everything just works. And, oops, and you can write foo templated on hello world. And that is everything you need for, um, for Hannah's use case of templating on, on a const extra uh, question. Um, so the question is, this is pointing out this is more like a, con a concept than a um, uh, than argument deduction because you're getting a different instantiation of foo out for each of the um, uh, when you have a different value going in. And I, I sort of see what you mean, but the um, it's more like an auto. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a it's kind of like a concept. Maybe you could do you could even in the future do concept auto here. I don't think I've actually looked at that interaction, but um, yeah, it's um, it's still using the mechanism of class template argument deduction in order to work out what those template arguments are. But yes, then you may have a different type as well as a different value of your of the thing you've instantiated. So uh, having this, being able to collapse this um, down to one template argument. Oops, another question. Uh, that's, so the question is, um, what does the deduction guide here do? It's basically saying that if you um, pass it an array of 14 characters, then you need, um, then you instantiate a fixed string of length 13 characters. But, but it, seems a little bit circular, doesn't it? It's, um, <laughs> um, find, find me after I can explain how this works. But it's, this is a, I don't want to do a talk on, on class template argument deduction now, because... <laughs> So I'll run out of time. This is not CPAD, it's just you're using a, a deduction or guide. 
Yeah, the deduction guide is something you added that, that is part of the C class template it's argument deduction feature. Using C pair, but this isn't C pair. Um, anyway, <laughs> moving on. All right. Um, so, having being able to have one template parameter with um, that you pass in, or one template argument that you pass in that is a string, means we can now have a user defined literal. Because um, we only get to pass one thing into a user defined literal. So um, in C20, we have this new form of user defined literal where you can put any, any um, class type in there as long as you can construct it from a, um, from a char array. Uh, and this, this now satisfies Richard Powell's use case for his named arguments. So that's, um, that pretty much covers C20 class type, non-type template parameters. We can use them for classes with strong structural equality and a couple of other restrictions. Um, the, the arguments we pass, um, the parameters are, are rarefied in the final binary. They're L values, so they, they just behave like normal objects. Uh, and we've enabled raw, raw, a raw form of string, uh, string UDL. So let's take another look at equality and identity because I had a question mark on whether this was, they were really equivalent earlier, and there are some caveats. So the first one is with, with uh, enumerations. With my classes, I was defining that, um, that default comparison operator within the body of the class, and that, and that is a requirement. It has to be within the body of the class so that you can't try to, um, try to use a class as a non-template parameter after defining the class without one, and then give it a comparison operator afterwards. You can't get into that mess because you have to define it up front. But we can't have that requirement for enums because firstly, they already have a comparison operator by default. And you can define one at any point afterwards. You can't define it in the body of the enum because they're not, they're not classes. Um, so after I've defined, I've used an enum in a non-type template parameter, someone can then define a comparison operator that makes no sense. Um, out of curiosity, can I have a show of hands who has ever defined a comparison operator for an enum? I have one very, uh, oh, two uh, embarrassed hands at the front here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, this is pretty rare, so I'm not, not too worried about it. The other one, um, uh, ooh, sorry, all right. So yeah, um, these comparison operators get ignored, basically. Even though one, uh, one is not equal to one, because it, it hits my, my uh, custom comparison operator here, um, the instantiation of x on one and x on one is still the same type. The compiler just kind of ignores the, the, uh, your, your operator. So the other example is pointers to members of unions, which is, something that I didn't even know was a thing until I started trying to specify this feature. But a pointer of a member is like an offset. It tells you that if I've got a type, a type U uh, and an integer within it, it's like where within this, this struct or union can I find that integer? Um, but with unions, they're all in the same place. They're all at the start. So even though I've got two members here of type int, which I didn't know why I'd ever do, um, they will, you know, they're kind of the same numeric value at runtime. So what happens when we try to instantiate um, x on, on the member u within a and the member c within a? So a within u and c within u. <laughs> well, <laughs> at runtime, they're equal. But the compiler will tell you that via, for, for instantiation purposes, um, there are different members and so you will get different template instantiations out. Actually, for the first line, if you try it on um, Clang, you will get different results if you ask the question of whether these are equal at runtime and at compile time. Because at compile time, it just puts it through the same machinery as it would for template instantiation, and it will tell you they're different. <laughs> but that, that's the bug in Clang, GCC gets it right. So we have this rule that identity is kind of equivalent to a quality plus type. It's almost equivalent, apart from use cases that I hope you're never going to hit. Uh, but because, because there is this, this sort of hole in the rule, um, there has there been a proposal to 
uh, remove class type, non type template parameters from C20 entirely. I mean, I think it's an overreaction, but, um, uh, and, you know, we'd lose three years of re specifying this and have, it, have a different feature in C23, but uh, the Belfast meeting is coming up in a couple of months. We'll see what happens. I, I hope we still have them in C20. All right, let's have a look at what. Um, what these do for the compile and memory usage. So earlier on, we tried out a standard, straightforward, um, non-templated UDL, and we compared it to the forbidden UDL. So next I want to look at what happens. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do the class type non-template parameter thing, parameter thing just yet. I'm gonna see what happens if we apply the technique we used in our printf implementation. What happens if we, we make an object of type fixed string and we template on a reference to that? This is like emulating class type non template parameters in C17. Well, this is even worse. Well, it's got better for Clang, it's got a lot worse, a lot worse for GCC. Okay, so is it any better if we actually template on fixed string rather than a reference? Um, well, we don't have any results result for Clang here, but for GCC, it gets worse again. This is not the result I was hoping for when I, when I did this benchmarking. Um, so yes, yeah, there's just no Clang, uh, buff Clang here. There's, there's no implementation. I couldn't, I couldn't run it. So I started digging into why this is the case. And I stumbled across uh, this variation of the test where I still templated on a fixed string. It was still the same size. It was still a megabyte. Um, but I didn't actually copy the data in. I just let it all stay as zero, default initialized. And um, all the memory usage disappeared. <laughs> so I so said, why is that? Well, I thought the, the obvious other thing to try is if I don't template on it, and I just construct the object during the context for evaluation, see, no, no, no templating on the fixed string here, or even a fixed string ref, what happens now? Well we pretty much get all the memory usage again. It's pretty much the same as templating on the fixed string ref or the fixed string. So this is interesting. Um, I'm just gonna collapse this down now to, um, to take off some of the, um, those experiments and just look at the forbidden UDL, templating on the fixed string ref and templating on the fixed string. Because I did, um, this, was, um, this was all I had at the time I turned up at this conference on Sunday. But someone then said to me, but um, what happens if you actually have the same amount of data, but you have a lot of smaller UDLs? So the compiler has a chance to accumulate this memory usage during the context for evaluation, but then you finish the context for evaluation, and it can clean up and do it again. So I split one megabyte into 100 lots of 10 kilobytes. I'd hope this would divide the memory usage by 100. So sadly not the case. So the light bars here are the ones where I split out the uh, one big string into lots of little strings. Well, little, that's 10 kilobytes. Uh, <laughs> um, so we take a haircut on performance, on, on memory usage, but, but it's not really what we were hoping for. So I, um, one day later, I think it was either Monday or Tuesday, I, I, was, uh, I was telling this uh, story to, um, to Richard Smith and Nathan Sibwell. And um, Nathan suggested that um, I do this, which makes absolutely no sense. What I'm doing here is I'm just defining an extra function after each evaluation of this, con this uh, UDL, which should have positive effects on memory usage. You'd think this would just increase the usage marginally because I have 100 extra functions. Well. <laughs> It turns out the, the semicolon at the end of a, dec a, a variable declaration does not trigger a garbage collection within GCC. However, defining a new function does trigger a garbage collection. And so this gets the behavior we were hoping to see before. And this will probably be implemented in the next uh, version of GCC or the next minor version because it's a really easy fix. So. Go back to the one megabyte and add an extra context um, If I go back to the one... I have not, the question was, what happens if I go back to the one megabyte and I add an extra, an extra context per function? Um, I have not tried it, but based on the reason why this happens, according to Nathan, I would expect there to be no, no impact on memory usage because you've accumulated, you're basically accumulating memory usage 
per iteration of a context, that context for loop in the, in the constructor of the fixed string. And you're only doing it once. There's nothing, there's nothing to garbage collect other than your peak usage is still the same. Um, okay, so let's, let's get rid of everything but the uh, GCC version plus one. And now we see that this fixed string UDL is actually better than the um, templating on a fixed string object. I'm not actually entirely sure why. It's, it's slightly better, but I think we can actually do a fair bit better in the future because there's been no effort to optimize this yet. This has just been, um, this is just the simplest implementation GCC could do um, with, no, with no effort to actually make it good on memory usage. Um, talking to compiler implementers has maybe given me confidence we can actually get this down to um, similar to the uh, original const jar star UDL. But yeah, don't, don't hold me to it. Okay, I also want to look at compile time. I'm not going to do such an in-depth investigation here, but um, this is microseconds per character of UDL in compilation. It's uh, not great, but we all know that like Context text for evaluation at the moment is not fast. There's a lot of work being done to um, make it faster. I would have loved to have done this on the um, EDG implementation because their context text for implementation is a lot faster than uh, GCC and Clang, but I didn't have access to it before this talk, so I don't have that data. But um, I do know that there is a new context text for evaluator being written for, um, for Clang that that will effectively compile context for code to a bytecode and interpret it, rather than chasing pointers all over the AST to do every bit of your evaluation. All right, last thing I want to look at is our printf example and what it looks like when we get to use C++20 class uh, non-type template parameters. So we have our conversion specifications and these are exactly the same as before. Don't need to make any changes to these at all. Um, that's just a lie. Uh, I do need to make these. I'm wondering why this compiles now, because these do not have um, comparison operators on them. I will look at that after the talk. <laughs> it compiled, I tested it, but uh, oh yes, because GCC doesn't actually implement the requirement of strong structural equality yet. It's just implemented the, the semantics of the feature. It hasn't, the restrictions aren't there because GCC hasn't implemented uh, defaulted comparison operators. So this actually compiled even though it doesn't have the, the, theory, the requisite uh, operator equals equals. Okay, this is find comp spec from before and this is find comp spec after. If you didn't see what changed, it is just this line at the top. It used to be a reference, a constant auto reference and now we actually get to put the type in there. We get to say it's a fixed string or the, the template ID in there to be, to be pedantic. Okay, no big improvement. Um, in the implementation of make print, uh, there's a few more differences. So we had this um, object underscore v thing we used to um, we used in order to turn our um, turn our com specs into global variables with linkage. Uh, we had to take all of our um, all of our conversion specifications and our format as references. We had to do this whole pull the conversion specification apart and put it back together. Then we had to do the decay on the type at the end. And if we convert this to C20, we don't have to do any of that. We just template on the fixed string. We template on a pack of conversion specifications. We accumulate the conversion specification by just, by just naming it. And we pull out the value type with decal type of, of comspec. Similarly, um, this is the usage of printf in C++, the usage of um, make print and, and how you actually you know, use it, use it um, you know, the final usage of it. Um, again, we don't have to do this whole uh, fixed string v global variable thing. Um, but also, we don't have to write our entire string as separate template, uh, separate characters just to make the uh, code conform to the standard. Um, and that is the end of my talk. Any questions? Uh, uh, do you want to use the microphone? We, we don't have.
Um, is fixed string also be part of C plus plus twenty? Oh, yes, I mentioned. I wanted to mention that during the talk. Unfortunately, not. Um, mainly due to lack of time to write the spec. Unfortunately, uh, string types in C++ have an enormous API, and for every function that is going to be a member of, uh, of that string, of that string type, you've got to specify that function, and it's an enormous amount of work to actually, to actually write the proposal for this, and I ran out of time before C++20. And I, I think it will be in 23. Okay, and, and if, you, if you want to use this technique in 20, we probably need this um, declaration plus a deduction guide everywhere um, in each yeah. template. You, you just need to write your own, your own fixed string. And that's it, okay. That's it, yeah. Okay. And most, most of the functions on fixed string, you, you actually implement fairly easy just by, just by delegating to string view because it implements them all and you can just, yeah, you can just form a string view out of your M data. So uh, the default to the equality operator is a requirement? Oh, uh, yes. So it seems like that wouldn't be, if structural equality is necessary, it seems like the assignment operator wouldn't be relevant. So, I mean, so the equality right, operator wouldn't be relevant. The, equal, uh, the equality operator never actually gets called, but it means that if you actually compare your objects at runtime, the, that notion of equality it uh, matches up with the notion of template instantiation. Mm -hmm. And it may well be that the standards committee goes in, into a direction that where the template, the concept of, concept of template identity and equality are further divorced in the future. Mm -hmm. But as a starting point, uh, we're allowing things where, where they match up. Okay. Hi, Jeff. That was a good talk. And thank yeah. you for helping get push, push this through the committee and uh, getting it into the standard. That's great. Um, I did want to point out one oversight, which also sort of helps answer Nico's question and might assist you some. Okay. So there was actually three attempts to get the UDL uh, in. The second attempt was in Urbana Champaign, um, where we proposed a fixed string type. Uh, and so the committee looked at that, and it was rejected because of the UDL was the reason why, mainly. Um, and so I think Louis may have also been working on a proposal for this, so you might want to get in touch with him. So, uh, yeah, Louis did, and uh, actually Louis ended up um, a, a, as a co-author of the final paper to add them. So Louis had a paper that would just let you uh, template on a string, um, which is, it satisfies, um, well, it, it wouldn't, I think it would let you use a UDL as a, as a um, in which you got a uh, const char star. I can't remember exactly how it worked, but it, it basically meant that you got that string literal that, uh, as a, temp, as a um, template parameter, uh, you, but you couldn't use arbitrary class types. Yeah. So this sort of subsumed it, and then we ended up taking the, the UDL proposal from Louis' proposal, putting it into my proposal for classes as non-type template parameters, and that's what ended up in um, C++ 20. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out too, that, that library type would be really helpful for generative programming, for metaprogramming, being able to make modifications to strings and insert them in places. Exactly. That, that's that's, that's uh, what really uh, made me want to pursue full classes as non-type template parameters is that you can then, it's not just your input string you can template on, you can then modify it, make a new one and template on that, um, which is uh, super helpful if you're, say, dissecting a regular expression into, uh, <laughs> into sub-regular expressions. Cool. Well, thank you all for coming.